Chapter 10 I'm going to do my lead-in first, Nadine looked around Eve's office and cocked a brow, not much of a sanctum, excuse me, casually, Nadine adjusted the angle of Eve's monitor, it squeaked, up till now, you've guarded this room like holy ground, I expected something more than a closet with a desk and a couple of ratty chairs, home's where the heart is, Eve said mildly, and leaned back in one of those ratty chairs, Nadine had never considered herself claustrophobic, but the industrial beige walls were awfully close together, making her rethink the notion, and a single, stingy window, though undoubtedly blast-treated, was unshaded and offered a narrow view of an air traffic snarl over a local transport station. The little room, Nadine mused, was full of crowds. I'd have thought after you broke the de Blas case last winter, you'd have raided a snazzier office, with a real window and maybe a little carpet. Are you here to decorate or to do a story? And your equipment's pathetic. Enjoying herself, Nadine clucked her tongue over Eve's work units. At the station, relics like this would be delegated to some low-level drone, or more likely, kicked to a charity rehab center. She would not scowl, Eve told herself. She would not scowl. Remember that, the next time you're tagged for a donation to the police and security fund. Nadine smiled, leaned back on the desk. At Channel 75, even drones have their own auto chef. I'm learning to hate you, Nadine. Just trying to get you pumped for the interview. You know what I'd like, Dallas. Since you're in the mood for exposure, a one-on-one, -on -one, an in-depth interview with the woman behind the badge. The life and loves of Eve Dallas. Snipes, the personal side of the public servant. Eve couldn't stop it, she scowled. Don't push your luck, Nadine. Pushing my luck spot I do best. Nadine dropped down into chair, shifted it. How's the angle, Pete? The operator held his palm-sized remote up to his face. Yo, Pete's a man of few words, Nadine commented. Just how I like them. Want to fix your hair? Eve caught herself before she tunneled her fingers through it. She hated being on camera. Hated it a lot. Number. Suit yourself. Nadine took a small, mirrored compact out of her oversized bag, patted something under her eyes, checked her teeth for lipstick smears. Okay. She dropped the compact back in her bag, crossed her legs smoothly with the faintest whisper of silk against silk, and turned toward camera. Roll. Rolling. Her face changed. Eve found it interesting to watch. The minute the red light glowed, her features became glossier. More intense, her voice, which had been brisk and light, slowed and deepened, demanding attention. This is Nadine first, reporting direct from Lieutenant Eve Dallas's office in the Homicide Division of Cop Central. This exclusive interview centers on the violent and as yet unsolved murders of Prosecutor Cicely Towers and award-winning actor Yvonne Metcalf, Lieutenant. Are these murders linked? The evidence indicates that probability. We can confirm from the medical examiner's report that both victims were killed by the same weapon, and by the same hand. There's no doubt of that, none. Both women were killed by a thin, smooth-edged blade, nine inches in length, tapered from point to hilt. The point was honed to a V. In both cases, the victims were frontally attacked with one swipe of the weapon across the throat from right to left and at a slight angle, Eve picked up a signature pen from her desk, causing Nadine to jerk and blink when she slashed it a fraction of an inch from Nadine's throat, like that. I see, this would have severed the jugular, causing instant and dramatic blood loss, disabling the victim immediately, preventing her from calling for help or defending herself in any way. Death would have occurred within seconds. In other words, the killer needed very little time. A frontal attack. Lieutenant, doesn't that indicate that the victims knew their attacker? Not necessarily, but there is other evidence that leads to the conclusion that the victims knew their attacker, or were expecting to meet someone. The absence of any defense wounds for example, if I came made you a broken bar Eve thrust out with the pen again, and Nadine threw a hand in front of her throat. You see, it's automatic defense. That's interesting. Nadine said and had to school her face before it scowled. We have the details on the murders themselves, but not on the motive behind them, or the killer. What is it that connects Prosecutor Towers to Yvonne Metcalf? We're investigating several lines of inquiry. Prosecutor Towers was killed three weeks ago, Lieutenant. 
yet you have no suspects, we have no evidence to support an arrest at this time, then you do have suspects, the investigation is proceeding with all possible speed, and motive, people kill people, miss first, for all manner of reasons, they've done so since we crawled out of the muck, biblically speaking, Nadine put in. Murder is the oldest crime, you could say it has a long tradition. We may be able to filter out certain undesirable tendencies through genetics, chemical treatments, beta scans, we deter with panel colonies and the absence of freedom. But human nature remains human nature. Those basic motives for violence that science is unable to filter, love, hate, greed, envy, anger, they separate us from the droids, don't they? And make us susceptible to joy, sorrow and passion. That's a debate for the scientists and the intellectuals. But which of those motives killed Cicely Towers and Devon Metcalf? A person killed them, Miss First. His or her purpose remains unknown. You have a psychiatric profile, of course, we do, you've confirmed. And we will use it and all of the tools at our disposal to find the murderer. I'll find him. Eve said deliberately flicking her eyes toward the camera. And once the cage door is closed, motive won't matter, only justice. That sounds like a promise, Lieutenant. A personal promise. It is. The people of New York will depend on you keeping that promise. This is Nadine first, reporting for Channel 75. She waited a beat, then nodded. Not bad, Dallas. Not bad at all. We'll run it again at 6 and 11, with the recap at midnight. Good. Take a walk, Pete. The operator shrugged and wandered out of the room. Off the record. Eve began. How much airtime can you give me? For exposure. I want plenty of it. I figured there was something behind this little gift. Nadine let out a little breath that was nearly a sigh. I have to say I'm disappointed, Dallas. I never figured you for a camera hound. I've got to testify on the model case in a couple of hours. Can you get a camera there? Sure. The model case is small ratings. But it's worth a couple zips. She pulled her diary out and noted it. I've got this thing tonight. Two, at the new Astoria. One of those gold plate dinners. The Astoria dinner ball. Sure. Her smile turned derisive. I don't work the social beat, Dallas. But I can tell the assignment desk to cue on you. You and Rourke are always good for the gossip eaters. It is you and Rourke, isn't it? I'll let you know where you can catch me over the next couple of days, Eve continued. Ignoring the insult, I'll feed you regular updates to air. Fine. Nadine Rose, maybe you'll trip over the killer on your way to fame and fortune. Got an agent yet? For a moment, Eve said nothing. Just tapped her fingertips together. I thought it was her job to fill airtime and guard the public's right to know, not to moralize. And I thought it was yours to serve and protect, not to cash in. Nadine snagged up her bag by the strap. Catch you on the screen. Lieutenant, Nadine, pleased, Eve tipped back in her chair. You left out one of those basic human motives for violence before. Thrill. I'll make a note of it. Nadine wrenched at the door, then let it slip out of her hands. When she turned back, her face was white and shocked under its sheen of camera makeup. Are you out of your mind? Your bait? Your fucking bait? Pissed you off, didn't it? Smiling. Eve allowed herself the luxury of propping her feet on the desk. Nadine's reaction had brought the reporter up several notches on Eve's opinion scale. Thinking about me wanting all that airtime, and getting it, really steamed you. It's going to steam him, too. Can't you hear him, Nadine? A look at that lousy cop getting all my press. Nadine came back in and sat down carefully. You had me, Dallas. I'm not about to tell you how to do your job aid and don't. Let me see if I'm figuring this right. You deduce the motive was, at least partially, for the thrill, for the attention in the media. Kill a couple of ordinary citizens. You get press, sure, but not so intense, not so complete. Kill two prominent citizens, familiar faces, and disguise the limit. So you make yourself a target. It's just a hunch, thoughtfully. Eve scratched a vague itch on her knee. It could be that all I'll end up with is a lot of idiotic blips of me on screen. Or a knife at your throat. Gee, Nadine, I'm going to start to think you care. I think I do. She spent a moment studying Eve's face. I've worked with, around, and through cops for a long time now. You get instincts on who's putting in time and who gives a damn. You know what worries me, Dallas. You give too much of a damn. I carry a badge. 
Eve said soberly and made Nadine laugh. Obviously you've been watching too many old videos, too. Well, it's your neck hey, literally. I'll see to it that you get it. Exposed. Thanks. One more thing, she added when Nadine stood again. If this theory has weight, then future targets would fall into the well-known, media hyped female variety. Keep an eye on your own neck, Nadine. Jesus. Shuddering. Nadine rubbed fingers over her throat. Thanks for sharing that, Dallas. My pleasure, Ella. Truly, Eve had time to chuckle between the time the door closed and the call came through from the commander's office. Obviously, he'd heard about the broadcast. She was still stinging a bit when she bolted up the steps of the courthouse. The cameras were there, as Nadine had promised. They were there in the evening at the new Astoria when she stepped out of Rourke's limo and tried to pretend she was enjoying herself. After two days of tripping over a camera every time she took three steps, she was surprised she didn't find one zooming over her in bed, and she said as much to Rourke. You asked for it, darling. She was straddling him, in what was left of the three-piece cocktail suit he'd chosen for her to wear to the governor's mansion. The glittering black and gold vest skimmed her hips and was already unbuttoned to her navel. I don't have to like it. How do you stand it? You live with this stuff all the time. Isn't it creepy? You just ignore it. He flipped open another button. And go on. I like the way you look tonight. Idly he toyed with the diamond that hung between her breasts. Of course. I'm enjoying the way you look right now more. I'm never going to get used to it. All the fancy work. Small talk. Big hair. And I don't fit the clothes. Either. They might not suit the lieutenant. But they suit Eve. You can be both. He watched her pupils dilate when he spread his hands over her breasts. Cup them. You like the food? Well, sure. Boot a broken bar she shivered into a moan as he scrapped his thumbs over her nipples. I think I was trying to make a point. I should never talk to you in bed. Excellent deduction. He reared up and replaced his thumbs with his teeth. She was sleeping deeply, dreamlessly. When he woke her, the cop surfaced first, alert and braced. What? Despite being naked, she reached for her weapon. What is it? I'm sorry. When he leaned over the bed to kiss her. She could tell from the vibrations of his body that he was laughing. It's not funny. If I'd been armed, you'd have been on your ass. Lucky me. Absently, she shoved at Galahad who decided to sit on her head. Why are you dressed? What's going on? I've had a call. I'm needed on Free Star One. The Olympus Resort. Lights. Dim. She ordered and blinked to focus as they highlighted his face. God, she thought. He looked like an angel, a fallen one, a dangerous one. Is there a problem? Apparently, nothing that can't be handled. Rourke picked up the cat himself, stroked it, then set Galahad on the floor. But I have to handle it personally. It may take a couple of days. Oh, it was because she was groggy, she told herself, that this awful sense of deflation snuck in. Well, I'll see you when you get back. He skimmed a finger over the dent in her chin. They'll miss me. Maybe. Some. It was his quick smile that defeated her. Yes. Here, put this on. He shoved a robe in her hands. There's something I want to show you before I go. You're going now? The transport's waiting. It can wait. I guess I'm supposed to come down and kiss you goodbye. She muttered as she fumbled into the robe. That would be nice. But first things first. He took her hand and pulled her from the platform to the elevator. There isn't any need for you to be uncomfortable here while I'm gone, right? He put his hands on her shoulders as the car began to glide. Eve, it's your at home now. I'm going to be busy. Anyway, she felt the slight shift as the car veered to horizontal mode. Aren't we going all the way down? Not just yet. He slipped an arm around her shoulders when the doors opened. It was a room she hadn't seen. Then again, she mused, there are probably dozens of rooms she yet to tour in the labyrinth of the building. But it took only one quick glimpse for her to realize it was hers. The few things she considered of any value from her apartment were here, with new pieces added to fill it out into a pleasant, workable space. Stepping away from Rourke, she wandered in. The floors were wooden smooth, and there was a carpet woven in slate blue and mossy green, probably from one of his factories in the east. Her desk, battered as it was, stood on the priceless wool and held her equipment. A frosted glass wall separated a small kitchen area, fully equipped, that led to a terrace. There was more. Of course, with Brooke there was always more. A communications board would allow her to call up any room in the house. The entertainment center offered music, video, 
a hologram screen with dozens of visualization options. A small indoor garden bloomed riotously below an arching window where dawn was breaking. You can replace what you don't like, he said as she ran her hand over the soft back of a sleep chair. Everything's been programmed for your voice and your palm print. Very efficient she said and cleared her throat. Very nice. Surprised to find himself riddled with nerves, he tucked his hands in his pockets. Your work requires your own space. I understand that. You require your own space and privacy. My office is through there, the west panel, but it locks on either side. I see. Now he felt temper snapping at the nerves. If you can't be comfortable in the house while I'm not here, you can barricade yourself in this apartment. You can damn well barricade yourself in it while I am here. It's up to you. Yes, it is. She took a deep breath and turned to him. You did this for me. Annoyed, he inclined his head. There doesn't seem to be much I wouldn't do for you. I think that's starting to sink in. No one had ever given her anything quite so perfect. No one, she realized, understood her quite so well. That makes me a lucky woman. Doesn't it? He opened his mouth, bit back something particularly nasty. The hell with it, he decided. I have to go. Rourke, one thing. She walked to him, well aware he was all but snarling with temper. I haven't kissed you goodbye, she murmured and did so with a thoroughness that rocked him back on his heels. Thank you. Before he could speak, she kissed him again, for always knowing what matters to me. You're welcome. Possessively, he ran a hand over her tousled hair. Miss me. I already am. Don't take any unnecessary chances. His hands gripped in her hair hard, briefly. There's no use asking you not to take the necessary ones. Then don't. Her heart stuttered when he kissed her hand. Safe trip, she told him when he stepped into the elevator. She was new at it so waited until the doors were almost shut. I love you. The last thing she saw was the flash of his grin. What have you got, Feely? Maybe something, maybe nothing. It was early, just 8 o'clock on the morning after Rourke left for Free Star 1, but Feeney already looked haggard. Eve punched two coffees, double strength, from her auto chef. You're in here at this hour, looking like you've been up all night, and in that suit. I have to deduce it's something, and I'm a gold star detective. Yeah, I've been noodling the computer, going down another level on the families and personal relations of the victims like you wanted. And, stalling, he drank his coffee, dug out his bag of candied nuts, scratched his ear. Saw you on the news last night. The wife did, actually. Said you looked flash. That's one of the kids' expressions. We try to keep up. In that case, you're rocking me. Feeney, that's one of the kids' expressions, too. Translation, you're not coming clear. I know what it means. Shit, this one cuts close to home, Dallas. Too close, which is why you're here instead of transmitting what you've got over a channel. So let's have it. Okay, he puffed out a breath. I was dicking around with David Angelini's records, financial stuff mostly. We knew he was into some spine twisters for gambling debts. He's been holding them off giving them a little trickle here and there. Could be he's dipped into the company till, but I can't get a lock on that. He's covered his ass. So, we'll uncover it. I can get the name of the spine twisters, she mused, thinking of Rourke. Let's see if he made them any promises eh like he'd be coming into an inheritance. Her brows knit. If it wasn't for Meatcalf, I'd think hard about somebody he owed hurrying up on the IOUs by taking out towers. Might be that simple. Even with Metcalf, she had a nice nest egg set aside. I haven't found anybody among the beneficiaries who needed quick money, but that doesn't mean I won't. Okay, you keep working that angle, but that isn't why you're here playing with your nuts. He nearly managed to laugh. Cute. Okay, here it is. I turned up the commander's wife. Run that by slow, Feeney. Real slow. He couldn't sit. So he sprang up to pace the small space. David Angelini made some healthy deposits into his personal credit account, for deposits of 50k over the last four months. The final one was keyed in two weeks before his mother got terminated. All right, he got his hands on 200k in four months, and banked it like a good boy. Where'd he get it? Fuck, she already knew. Yeah, I accessed the e-transactions. Backtracked. She transferred it to his New York bank, and he flipped it over into his personal account in Milan. Then he withdraws it, in cash, hard bills, 
at an auto hotel on Vegas too. Jesus Christ, why didn't she tell me? Eve pressed her bald fists to her temples. Why the hell did she make us look for it? It wasn't like she tried to hide it, Feeney said quickly. When I clicked over to her records, it was all out front. She has an account of her own, just like the commander. He cleared his throat at Eve's level stare. I had to look. Dallas, he hasn't made any unusual transactions out of his, or out of their joint. But she's cut her principal in half doling out to Angelini. Christ, he was bleeding her. Blackmail, Eve speculated, struggling to think coolly. Maybe they had an affair. Maybe she was stuck on the bastard. Oh man, oh Jesus. Feeney's stomach did a long sickening roll. The commander, I know, we have to go to him with this. I knew you were going to say that. Mournfully. Feeney took a disc out of his pocket. I got it all. How do you want to play it? What I want to do is go out to White Plains and knock Mrs. Whitney on her perfect ass. Barring that, we go to the commander's office and lay it out for him. They've still got some of that old body armor down in storage. Feeney suggested as Eve rose. Good thinking. They could have used it. Whitney didn't climb over his desk and body slam them. Nor did he pull out his stunner. He did all the damage necessary with the lethal glare of his eyes. You accessed my wife's personal accounts, Feeney. Yes, sir, I did. And took this information to Lieutenant Dallas. As per procedure. As per procedure. Whitney repeated. Now you're bringing it to me. To the commanding officer, Feeney began. Then drooped. Oh hell, Jack. Was I supposed to bury it? You could have come to me first. But then a broken bar Whitney trailed off, shifted his hard eyes to Eve's. Your stand on this, Lieutenant. Mrs. Whitney paid David Angelini a sum of $200,000 over a four-month period. This fact was not volunteered during either primary or follow-up interviews. It's necessary to the investigation that a she broke off. We have to know why, Commander. The apology was in her eyes. Lurking just behind the cop, we have to know why the money was paid, why there have been no more payments since the death of Sicily Towers. And I have to ask, Commander, as primary, if you were aware of the transactions and the reason behind them, there was a clutching in his stomach, a burning that warned of untreated stress. I'll answer that after I've spoken with my wife. Sir, Eve's voice was a quiet plea. You know we can't allow you to consult with Mrs. Whitney before we question her. This meeting has already risked contaminating the investigation. I'm sorry, Commander. You're not bringing my wife in to interview. Jack A. Fuck this. Feeney. She's not going to be dragged down here like a criminal. He clutched his hands into fists under the desk and struggled to remain in control. Question her at home. With our attorney present. That doesn't violate procedure, does it? Lieutenant Dallas? No. Sir, with respect, Commander, will you come with us? With respect, Lieutenant, he said bitterly, you couldn't stop me.